uh, they're making me work twice as hard at this conference. I have to present twice, not just once. So this one is going to be, um, I'm sorry, I'm just setting up because I was presenting in the other room, of course, and so I have everything set up for the other presentation, but I also have this presentation ready to go. Great. Okay. Hello again. <laughs> um, thanks for coming. Were uh, people at the earlier, uh, or did you attend the earlier presentations about QML and Qt? Just put your hand up so I can, because I don't want to talk about things I've ar you've already heard and then you'd be like, oh, this is so boring. So I'm trying not to bore you, you see. Great. So, uh, what I thought, I, well, what I'm going to be talking about for the next 20 or 25 minutes is uh, writing applications for uh, use on mobile devices with Plasma Active. And I'll tell you a little bit about what Plasma Active is first, because that's probably a good way, place to start. Um, as I said in my last presentation, I sometimes have a habit of going of talking really, really quickly. Um, if I do that, or if um, you, uh, I need to repeat something, just put your hand up or something and, and uh, I will slow down or, or repeat. And if you have any questions as well, just ask right away so that we don't have to, you don't have to wait until the end. Okay, great. So, um, everyone can hear me okay? The back, good, awesome. So, Plasma Active, what is it? Um, I actually showed this last year uh, when I was here at Cost Cup on a tablet. Um, we've come a fair ways since then. Um, and what Plasma Active is, um, it is a uh, full stack. It's a, we use Linux as the operating system. Um, and it's not uh, specific to any one uh, Linux variety. We use Mer, Migo, um, OpenSUSE. Um, some people are working on uh, an Ubuntu-based derivative. Um, so, uh, but as long as it's a fairly normal Linux uh, kernel and, and user space, uh, it runs on top of this. And it is a UI for, uh, or a, a way of creating UIs really, for use in devices. Um, it uses most of the same code from Plasma Desktop that KDE puts out. So we're seeing screenshots right here now of the tablet UI, um, optimized for both seven as well as 10 inch screens, um, completely touch friendly and, and meant to be used with your fingers as one would expect with the tablet. And what's interesting is, so Plasma Desktop, the workspace, the code that's specific to the workspace um, you know, the desktop the, and whatnot is around right now about 300,000 lines of code altogether. That's everything all in. The difference between the desktop that works very much like a traditional, you know, Windows or Macintosh desktop with, you know, the windows and taskbars and launchers and all of that, um, and the tablet interface is right now uh, around 15,000 lines of code. So that's a very small difference for a very big, a uh, very small difference in the code for a very big difference in results. And that really lies at the heart of the design um, of Plasma Active. So we use uh, Nokia's Qt, well, yes, yes, for how long, we'll see. Um, for, we use Qt and uh, primarily QML, which is a declarative language. We'll be looking at some examples of it um, in a little bit uh, to produce the, the user interface. 
Um, so we don't reinvent those wheels. We don't replace Qt. We build on top of it. And what we provide is a way to create uh, user interfaces, both applications and widgets, as well as the whole primary user interface. Um, so the thing you see when you first turn on the device. Um, we provide the ability to create those bits. So it's the very high, the kind of the, the top level of things. We also maintain images, um, so you can download an image uh, with a full uh, installable image um, with the full uh, Linux kernel and, and user space and everything already pre-configured. So you just can throw it onto a device. We've been focusing um, in Plasma Active for the last year and a bit, year and a half now, I guess, uh, on touch devices. Uh, primarily tablets, um, but it's not limited to that either. The design, the technological design behind it means it's well suited for um, all sorts of, of applications. We have one group that's actually working on Media Center, which is designed to be used um, on a television with, from a, a, a distance, um, and we're actually hoping, uh, well, we're not hoping, we're working on it, to pair up uh, tablets with your media center, so instead of having a remote control, which I personally hate, I hate those things, um, you would just use your tablet to control your media from wherever you are. In fact, um, already what I can do is something like start the music playing, um, turn on my tablet, subscribe to the controls on my tablet, and then walk around my house and change the song. And if my wife disagrees with me, she can change it back from hers. <laughs> so it's this multi-user uh, experience without any real configuration or needing to know how this all works behind the scenes. So what we're going to look at is how you might be able to write an application um, using the, the Plasma Active Technologies. And I only have like 15 or 20 minutes. This is going to be very quick. Um, I'm only going to cover a few uh, of the of the biggest topic topics. So the the first uh, principle to understand is the idea of of packages. Um, all Plasma Active um, applications are shipped uh, in a package, as you would expect, and our packages are done um, much like some other. Uh, uh, designs where it's all zipped into one file. That one zip file is then installed onto the, uh, the device you're going to run it on, and it runs the the content inside the uh, the compressed file. What's a little different is the contents of the package may change depending on the device. One of our goals was that. If we have a media center and a laptop and a tablet, I don't want to maintain three completely different versions of my application. And if I want to run it on a uh, Intel-based laptop, but then on an ARM-based tablet, I also shouldn't have to maintain two separate packages. We wanted one package where all my stuff is, um, still keep it small and manageable. So I'll show you an example. Um, so this is a very, very simple uh, widget that can either be run uh, in a window on its own or it can be run um, as part of the, the desktop, as a desktop widget. And this is the, the package. It's uncompressed, so we can take a look at it. Um, this is actually from the KDE Examples Git repository. So if you want to take a look, all the code we'll be looking at today is actually available in KDE's Git uh, repository. So you can go and look at these things for yourself afterwards, too. So Inside the package, we have a metadata.desktop file. Um, and this is a very, very simple file that gives it a name, a comment. The most important things, besides what license you're releasing it under, in this case, it's GPL, um, the plugin name. And we use reverse uh, name notation, much like Java does, so that you don't conflict with other people's brilliant work. Um, so in this case, it's org.kde.nowplaying-qml. Um, and this is just used internally so that your application can be uniquely identified on the, on the system. Um, again, very similar to how Java does it, for instance. 
beside the metadata.desktop file, there is a contents folder. Um, and in here, there will be one or more directories or folders for each kind of content. So if you have image data, that can be an SVG or PNG or JPEG, we'll get to that later. Um, you'd have an images directory here. And if you have uh, external JavaScript code, so uh, for instance, I wrote one uh, application that was pulling uh, XML uh, from a website. And I, of course, didn't want to write my own parser. Um, and so I just included a really good JavaScript XML parser. Um, and I just threw it in a code folder, et cetera. So this app is, is very, very simple. Um, in this case, it has just a QML file and, or, or folder. And inside there, it has just the one main.qml. Now, it's interesting with, uh, with the, the package system is that from within your code, you can request other items in your package. So if you have an image, you can just say, give me the image named whatever it's called, the file name. And it will find it in the package wherever it happens to be installed um, on disk. So it allows you not to worry about or think about um, what uh, uh, or, or how the installation process works. You just think always in terms of where does it exist inside the, the package and you address it that way. So there will always be a main uh, script file that kicks everything off, that starts it, um, in which case that's this guy. And what he does, and we'll come back to him, uh, this now playing um, later, again, we look at, at using data and services. Um, what this does is it allows you to actually control uh, a media player, um, either locally or, or over the network. Another really cool thing with packages, um, we have this contents folder. And obviously, this keeps all the content separate from things like the metadata. However, we can also have folders specific to devices. So I can have a folder here named um, you know, Vivaldi, or I can have a folder here named uh, Desktop. And I can put UI, code, um, graphics, whatever I want, specific to that device or that form factor. And then when I reference that from my code, it will look and go, oh, I'm running on this kind of device. I should be using that code from over there. So you can actually keep your, your, um, uh, your common code. So maybe you have you know, a lot of business logic code. That would go into contents. But maybe you have some UI tweaks. Maybe the UI is different, whether it's on a phone or a tablet or a media center. You might put the UI in separate folders here. And then it all happens magically. And inside your code, you don't have to worry about figuring out, oh, what device am I on? And what screen size is it? And so I should use that one over there. But the customized uh, uh, files, whether it's UI or code, in the right subfolders. And Plasma Active does the rest for you at runtime. So that's the basic concept of packages. Um, I will show you. Let's see if I can do it that way. Um, or does this work? No. Does that work at all? Nope. Yes. Ooh, cool. That's it. Yeah, that's even better. You can still hear me? OK, back there? Good. So uh, let me make this a bit bigger. E. Cool. So um, I am going to go to. KD graphics. Uh, ah, right. So this is Ocular, which is a desktop application for reading PDFs, eBooks, eComics, etc. We also have an active application for it. And um, here, let's open up Dolphin here. So this is using all the same code that we use for the desktop application for rendering. Um, it does multi-threaded rendering, thumbnails, table of contents, searching, all of this stuff. But we've written a, um, a plasma act or an active application around it. And just like all of them, it has a package. 
Now, in this case, it's a little bit unique. Uh, well, the more advanced applications often have this, where they have a small amount of uh, C++ code that does some glue work or um, does some things that just aren't easy outside of C++. Perhaps you're using a C library, which we are here, actually, to actually do all the rendering. We don't want to do that, obviously, in JavaScript. So um, that is actually be being done in a C library. And in this case, we're actually linking to it from our uh, C application. But it, it has a package, which looks very much like the very simple now playing widget. But in this case, it's a rather more complex application. And so here is all the UI for it, including a, uh, an image, um, both an SVG as well as a, uh, a PNG. So what this ends up looking like is this. And it is fully touch enabled. I'm pretending I'm touching it, but it's really my mouse. Um, but yeah, so this is using almost all the same code that we have written for the desktop renderer, but we've got a nice touch UI on top of it. And as you could see inside the package, there actually weren't that many files. Um, it took our uh, engineer who was working on this, uh, it, he had it actually working the second day he started working on it. And we took the first half of the first day to do the UI, how we wanted the UI to look a bit. Um, and then he spent the afternoon and then part of the next day and he had it basically working. And then of course it went to QA and they found bugs, which they always do. And uh, they spent, it was about a week, um, over, over the period of a week, he didn't work on it for a full week, but over the period of a week he worked out bugs. And that's all he had to do because we already had all the rendering um, for the, or done and, and proven for the desktop application. So it's very nice, you can write uh, des or, or uh, touch friendly or mobile apps or apps if you're looking for you know, a, a car platform or a media center platform uh, without having to rewrite everything um, from the ground up because we're a very normal um, Linux runtime and so you can use things like the C libraries. So if I tap over here, I can also pull out this drawer. This drawer is a standard component and we'll look at components in a bit. Um, and it has things like kinetic scrolling and all these other things you, you would hope and expect. And if I'm patient and wait, you'll, you'll actually start to fill in the rendering um, of the pages, which is not doing for me right now for some reason. If it had a table of, oh, there we go. Um, if we had a table of contents, this would be touchable, as would be the bookmarks if I made any. Now, what's really kind of neat is if I make this smaller, I don't know how well you can see it, but it has a very typical kind of mobile, um, yeah, let's put that away, um, uh, scroll bar on the side. So you can see how far you have to scroll on the side, but it's not actually a big chunky scroll bar that exists all the time. If I run that exact same application, and this is one of the neat things about the packaging system, but I tell it, I, I, I was lying to it. I said, you're on a tablet. <laughs> But now I'm not lying to it. I'm letting it figure out what it's on. It's figured out it's on a laptop. And so now I get the much more traditional mouse-friendly scroll bars on the side. And there's no change to the application. The application doesn't see it. There's no special code in the application for this. The framework handles all of it, which is nice, right? Because as an app developer, you just write an app that works and looks pretty good. And we have some people that work on the tablets, some people that work on laptops. They have different preferences. And when they're done, then they swap and try it on the other device. And usually it's very small tweaks, if any, if the UI design is basically done okay, that need to be done because the framework actually handles picking what needs to be used for that device. So now that we have our device and, and we've got our, our, our application and it's in a package, we want to get it the, the tasty stuff. We want to get it data um, and services for that matter. So there's essentially three uh, facilities that we provide, um, models, data engines, and services. And models are very nice and very simple. They're a basic model view controller style where you create a model. You can either do this purely inside of your QML or you can do it from C, C++ and import it in. We have the ability to import uh, transparently and automatically G-object based uh, collections. We have the ability to bring in Qt-based models. 
Um, and you can also just create random models in your QML at runtime. Obviously, if it's written in C++ or C, it's a lot more efficient at runtime, but for small models, it doesn't matter at all. So models are number one. And the cool thing with models is, once you have a model, um, all you do is you throw it at, oh, this is not gonna connect from here. Oh, good enough, it did. You just, so these are all models um, that you're seeing here that are actually written in C++. They're asynchronous loading over the network um, a list of a catalog of books. Um, again, this is an active application written in QML. I can grab, these are all books from uh, Project Gutenberg. So all of these are just models. Um, it's in a C++ library that hides all the scary stuff of how is the actual network uh, conversation happening? How is the XML being parsed in the back end? And the UI in QML just says, give me the model, the library gives it the model and we throw the model quite literally at the QML, it's one line. It says model is and the name of the model and it shows up. It's really quite magical. So I showed earlier um, the now playing example. I'll show it again here. Let me make this bigger. Oh, it's ambiguous. Uh, That's the slow way of doing it, isn't it? There we go. So <clears throat> we also have data engines and services. Thank you. Um, what data engines are is they're a way to represent mixed collections of data in a standardized and easy to consume form. So in this case, it's loading the, a data engine called Now Playing. It's not too complicated. Um, it's con and data engines um, have what we call sources. So what one source in this case is called players. And this is a list of all the players that it can see locally or remotely. And there's some signals you can connect to on data changed is one of them. And so whenever the data inside of the data engine changes, you get notified and you can take action. In this case, if it's playing, then it changes the play button to pause. If it's not playing, it changes it to the start um, icon. It sets the uh, progress bar so you can see how far along in the, in the song or video you are. Very simple stuff. So that's data engines. But of course, that's, uh, data engines are shared between all instances accessing the same data, so it's low on memory usage. Um, but it's read-only. So often, I mean, a media widget, a now playing media widget would be pretty useless if you couldn't actually like stop it or change it or whatnot. So we need some way to write or actually access a service. So data engines can provide related services. In this case, we say, oh, I am working with this player. Maybe it's Amarok or whatever you prefer to use. Um, and it says, okay, I'm, I'm interacting with that media player. Give me the service for that media player. And then you have a very kind of web style um, RPC mechanism. So in this case, when you hit play, it asks right here for the service for the source, and then it starts an operation call, um, and the operation description are all the parameters. So basically, in this case, if it's playing, we pause it. If it's paused, we, or, or not playing, we play it. And so we just set the, the parameters. Um, it's very simple JavaScript, because that's what it is, and away you go. So getting at data is very nice and easy and simple. We have one data engine, for instance, that tells you about the device, what's available on it. Does it have a home button, a hardware button? Does it have uh, rotation? Does it have GPS? Does it have these other various things? Um, and so you can access device-specific data in a device-independent manner. So if you're running it um, uh, on a Android kernel, um, it uses the Android style for uh, to detect what is available in power management in this uh, data engine. Um, it's running on the desktop, uh, Linux, it uses the, well, if it's running the desktop, it uses the libsolid, which does all the multi-platform desktop-y stuff. So it allows you, again, to write your applications once, essentially, access very, what's normally complex data to get at, um, even interact with it using services, and you don't care. It's all asynchronous. It might be local, it might be remote, um, it might be some operating system you've never seen but it's consistent between devices. Quickly, theming and graphics. I don't have much time yet, uh, left. 
Uh, theming and graphics. We support multiple for, uh, file formats, including SVG, PNG, JPEG. SVG is really interesting because you can have multiple uh, elements inside your one SVG, which our graphic designers love. They love to give us these gigantic SVGs with all the individual pieces in one file. And you can access these individual components by name from inside of your app and have it and just say, okay, show this part of that SVG here. And all the magic in behind the scenes of the parsing, the caching, so it doesn't take forever to render every time, the sharing of pix maps. If you're showing the exact same elements in two different places, you it's implicitly shared behind your back, so you have low memory usage, etc. Um, we already saw the ability to switch some of the look and feel automatically, and again, this all happens transparently for you. Um, UI components with QML, really, really quickly. If uh, what we were looking at is uh, earlier was QML, which is a declarative language, allows you to define essentially all the states of your UI at once. It creates a state machine. You can uh, uh, write small procedures in JavaScript that get run on certain signals or certain user events. Um, the one problem with QML is it doesn't provide any standard widgets or didn't used to anyways, which is really odd because it comes with Qt, which is you know known for being a widget library. So we've been working for some time on the idea of Qt components, and we're working with the people who work on Qt itself. In fact, I was at a few of the design meetings in Oslo personally, first starting to work on these things. Um, we have a complete set of components for uh, touch devices as well as for desktop devices. We keep the API consistent with the uh, Qt components that you'll find on um, the N9, for instance, as much as possible anyways. We're actually actively collaborating in both directions to ensure API compatibility. Um, we provide components for all kinds of things, those drawers that slide out, um, multiple tab, you know, tab boxes, radio boxes, uh, date spinners, um, the whole bit. Basically everything that you would need for a desktop or a mobile application and a few extra fun widgets we have there as well. We're also able to wrap very complex things into components. So when we saw the PDF viewer, or the ebook reader, the ebook reader was actually using um, a component that was a QML component that was written, there's a little bit of C++ there to do the, the bridging, just so it's very efficient. Um, but to the QML, it just looks like any other bit of, of QML. Um, and it shows up as a, as a QML component. We also have the same thing for mapping. So we have the marble map, which draws from uh, OpenStreetMap uh, for its data. And you get this very complex, in terms of what it can do, functionality. It does routing. It does, I mean, everything you expect from a modern map. Um, and that also is a QML component. So we often do this as we're designing um, our applications. We create Q, uh, QML components. And then what's very cool is once you've made a component, if you install it, uh, globally, then other QML applications can also access it. So it's a, a really nice way to share code between applications as well. Wow, I actually made it through all that. There's a lot more, obviously, and a lot of details I didn't go into. Um, but that's kind of the basic idea. We use QML components. We have data engines, services, and models for data. Um, and we have the idea of packages. And altogether, this allows us to create these multi-platform uh, multi-device, or what we like to call device spectrum applications with very little effort and with what we think anyways is very high quality results. Ah, one thing I wanted to mention, I forgot, about theming and graphics. Uh, none of the theming and graphics is hard-coded in or hard-baked, so if you were doing a custom device of some sort, you can very easily replace it. And this is something we originally designed for the desktop because people on Linux desktops like to do silly things with their desktop. Um, so we made it completely themable and it turns out this is really convenient when you're creating lots of different devices because you might want a very specific branded um, device. How do you do this without rewriting everything? You replace the SVGs, maybe tweak a few QML files here and there and you're done. Um, so we did a seven inch tablet and a 10 inch tablet for instance. Um, the seven inch tablet was after the 10 inch tablet and I think the total delta, like the patch that actually made the change, there was like three new SVGs and there was a one six line patch that tweaked some of the default values for icon sizes. And that was it. So I think it's very cool um, and something you don't find uh, anywhere else in, the, uh, in this solution space right now. Cool. 
thank you very much for your, your time and your attention and sorry for going so quickly. Um, maybe we have time for one question or two questions, if there are any. The plasma tablet, mm. uh, can I buy now? Meet me out back later. No, <laughs> I got a tablet right here for you. Um, actually, it's a very sad, sad tale. Um, we're still working on it. I'm hoping, I haven't really said anything about it in the last month or so. Um, what happened was we had everything ready to go, and unfortunately, we're not going to be selling millions at, the, at day one. So we don't have a lot of push with the manufacturer um, who's in mainland China. And they were like, ah, oh, we have a new revision of our device. It's much better. It has twice as much memory. It has, it's so much better. And the, but it's like basically the same, just more memory and you know, a few other nice little things. Like, great, cool. And we got the device. Uh, the, it was a completely new revision of the board, um, which threw away around two months of our work. Um, and then as we started putting it through QA, we found, unfortunately, a number of issues with the, the new hardware um, and had to make the very hard decision of saying, I would not feel comfortable selling this to people, um, which was a very difficult decision to make. <laughs> um, so we're now working on a different uh, bit of hardware that I hope I can announce soon um, that I'm, I'm happy with the quality again. Um, it's, it's a learning process for us, or for me, I'll take personal responsibility for that. Um, we talk with a lot of companies that do devices like tablets, and of course everyone is like, well, we have Android, it works, people know Android, and no one wants to go first often, right? Um, people just want to do what everyone else is doing. So we, we realized we had to do it ourselves. The unfortunate thing is, is that this is new for us, and so it's been a really big learning curve, and I've... Thankfully, I've learned a lot, um, know a lot more about manufacturing hardware now um, than I did, say, a year ago. Um, but yeah, we're still working out the last bit, so I'm, I'm hoping very soon we'll be able to uh, sell you and everyone in here multiple devices. So we're also working, as I said, also on a set-top box that we haven't announced um, that would work completely in tandem with this. So the vision there is you have your, you know, your movies and your videos and everything, and you walk in and you have your tablet um, and as you walk in, whoever, whatever, whatever tablets you've set is okay. Obviously, you don't want your neighbor changing your channel. But um, you walk in, you have a full, proper UI with you know what you would expect if you're running it on your on your phone or on your tablet. None of this, you know, buttons, you know, n a number pad. Ah, I hate that stuff. Um, so it all works together over the local network, so you can actually control it and interact with it from your tablet. And so that'll be another de uh, device we'll bring out next year. But um, I'm still hoping and I'm fairly confident we'll get the tablet out in time for people to order it for Christmas presents. So, Thank you. Yeah. Probably so much more than you needed to know about that too. Does Plasma Active currently support um, Loud Media Framework, like playing the movies? Uh, playing the H.264 codecs or mm -hmm. playing AAC or MP3 codecs? Yeah, so there is a video, Q, uh, a media, really, QML component, um, and it uses whatever's on the device. So um, if the codecs are on the device, which is mostly a licensing issue rather than any technology issue, um, then yes, it does work, um, and it actually works rather well. Yeah. So um, one of the things that's really exciting for me anyways, about Qt5 and QML2 is uh, right now uh, what happens is the QML is, is uh, parsed and the rendering starts. Um, and hopefully in the back end, there's a, a decent paint engine that uses the hardware. But it goes through this kind of software medium uh, middle layer. With QML2, that goes completely away. And it's completely OpenGL. Um, so everything gets rendered right on the hardware. So we find that with QML2 and Qt5, um, the things like running full screen uh, video on fairly low power devices is noticeably smoother again um, because of this. So, and in fact, if you look up on YouTube, there's some crazy 
crazy videos of guys doing live coding on the Raspberry Pi, which is a, not a very powerful device. And he's actually doing real-time transforms of, of uh, high-def video. Um, and it's just on this little device. And that's with, with QML2. We can play back with QML1 completely fine. Um, I wouldn't suggest doing real-time transforms on it in QML1. But with QML2, as long as you have a decent GPU, which pretty much all devices do these days, yeah, it's insane what you can do with it. Yeah. But again, you need the codex. And yeah, <laughs> so, but that's yeah, a simple matter of yeah, licensing what needs to be licensed. Cool. And if you feel more comfortable asking the question in Chinese, I'm sure someone can translate as well. So. Okay. Uh, thanks, cool. Aaron. Thank you.